Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. And now, your host, Mark Redfield. I've known Mike Gold casually for a few years, having met at a Baltimore Comic Con, and every year when he and I sit next to each other in artist Mark Wheatley's Insight Studios booth, we just chat our fool heads off. That is, when Mike isn't off to some panel discussion to impart wisdom and insight gained from over 30 years in the comic book industry as an editor or publisher. What's a Baltimore Comic Con, some of you ask? A Comic Con is a convention, usually held in a town's convention center or state fairgrounds cow palace. Many cities have them. San Diego's is the largest and most congested with men, women, and children jammed together in these unnatural airplane hangar-sized airless spaces. The Baltimore Comic Con is a fair-sized ordeal where superhero fans meet up once a year in Baltimore's ugly convention center. Saturdays are always the busiest, where the crowds are so thick one crabs sideways through them to get to the convention center's licensed food vendors that serve some really horrible combinations of fried foods. I think they boil their hamburgers the way hot dogs are boiled by street vendors. Working one's way through the crowded aisles, eyeballing the colorful wares of vendors of all kinds, and colorful cosplay, which is costume dress-up for the uninitiated, occasionally wading through a cloud of body odor reminding you of the humanity. Ah, the vendors. Everything related to the comics industry is for sale here. Toys, clothing, and of course, occasionally, comic books. One or two vendors actually sell vintage comics, some that cost the same as a used Honda. Talk about sticker shock. There are some serious book collectors out there. But the best part are the artists, either in Artists Alley or in special booths, as every year the convention features some of the big names and stars of the comics world. Meeting your favorite artist and chatting for a bit is a blast, and something the fans like the most. There are also many guests at a Comic-Con that are stars or celebrities from films and television. Linda Carter, TV's Wonder Woman, was the headliner at the 2017 Baltimore Comic-Con, for instance. A big draw. Which brings me back to Mike Gold. I wondered how different the comic book industry was for writers, artists, and creators... Uh, than, say, from the film business. I had suspicions that they were very much alike, with a giant gulf between the small indie publisher and the corporate giants that ruled the roost, with a barren no-man's land in between. Where and how does a writer start in the comics industry today? And hasn't the entertainment industry, movies, television, and once upon a time radio, always, always boosted sales for comic books? As for the readers, where do people who love the new Marvel movies and TV shows go to get the printed source material? Does anybody read anymore? I'm pretty sure that your first exposure to a superhero was in a movie, TV show, or, if you're old enough, radio, before you held a comic book in your hand. Notice the music themes playing under me? All recognizable, all from movies and TV shows. Mike Gold started in the comics industry at DC Comics in the 1970s and then went on to launch First Comics in 1983 during that fertile decade, a happy time, the 80s, when both indie comics and indie films could flourish, be created and find a way to market and to an audience. Mike went back to DC Comics and continued his successful career as an editor, and in 2006, he founded Comic Mix with Glenn Howman and Brian Alvey. Mike and I hit it off when we met, because among other passions we share, like for old-time radio and movies of all kinds, we both have something of a theater background. He worked for a bit with the Organic Theater Company in Chicago, where he's from. And we both lean rather left and progressive in our politics. So, at the 2018 Baltimore Comic Con, while we both sat at booth number 118, merrily chatting our fool heads off, I asked him if I could turn the recorder on, and in the roaring, noisy convention center hall, asked him about the current state of the comic book industry, especially for creators, be they newcomers or seasoned pros. Here's Mike Gold. 
The state of the comic industry is peculiar, which is about this. It's been peculiar for a good 80 years now, so we're, we're maintaining the streak. Sales are pretty dreadful because there's no place to buy comic books. The online sales are, are picking up dramatically, and that's making up for the difference. So slowly but surely, the medium is sort of being dragged into the 21st century. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we have all of these movies and television shows, and that's wonderful for, for a variety of reasons. The creators make some money, sometimes really good money. Uh, the publishers make some money, and that'll help subsidize everything else. Uh, it doesn't bring us a lot of new readers. That happened during the Batman TV show 50 years ago, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to be in effect really ever since then. Wonder Woman and the Hulk, they didn't really go through major increases in uh, circulation back in, the, in their day. So what do, what do um, you know, this just seems to be a really big gulf then. Um, and it's like that in almost every industry, the independent film uh, makers, there's a giant canyon between, uh, I mean, there was a time where they could get them into Blockbuster, and they right. could get them into certain kind of film festivals, and then maybe, you know, a couple of people would, uh, John Pearson or, or the Weinstein brothers would buy something. It seems that the, for creators, for writers and artists, it's pretty much the same way in the comic book industry today. The independent comics movement has, has been with us really since the very early 50s. It's never been very big because it was a newsstand operation and the, the publishers that survived the whole Frederick Wortham thing and the Comics Code stuff, they pretty much controlled the newsstands. So the smaller guys couldn't get in. These days, the smaller guys uh, combined represent maybe about a fifth of the of total circulation, but it gives people wonderful opportunity. Also, it gives creators the opportunity to have something published that they can show to Hollywood. I use Hollywood generically. And, um, Would Jay Ford please go to Bob Hall? No, but... And would The independent publishers, independent filmmakers, these days they're going the route that, that musicians have taken for a couple of decades of sort of circumnavigating their, the big guys because the big guys really can't deliver anything all that big anymore. That's not where the money is and that is most certainly not where the creativity is. And I think that that's true for independent comics more so today than ever uh, because creators are willing to go self-publish or go with one of the smaller so-called independent publishers in order to to get their stuff out there the way they want it. I mean, you want to you want to do a Batman story, you want to do a Hulk story, you want to do an Archie story. You're going to be doing it for those guys, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that if that's the type of story you want to tell. Right. I've worked both ways, and I've had a lot of fun working both ways. And now at this point in my career, because I'm 20, 30,000 years old, I, I can. Uh, uh, you know, just take a couple of projects that are really dear to me and, and, and work on those, and that that's fun. For newcomers, it's a wonderful, the independent comics route is a wonderful way to get noticed. It, again, it depends on your your goals. If, if you want to do Superman, you know, starting off with an independent is really a good idea because you can show them your work. Yeah. You know, you, you can always show publishers portfolios if you're an artist and Lord knows I've seen an astonishing number of portfolios some very good you know so you don't want to not look but for writers it's almost impossible because yeah. no, nobody has time to sit down and read a, 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 a script so what I generally do is I talk with them and see if they can think and if they have stories to tell and 
they can tell those stories in ways that people will understand it. I'm naive about this. I don't really know where the industry is today. I don't know how it works. I'm coming from, I mean, I'm self-publishing things. I'm coming out of a filmmaker world, an actor's world. There are things you do and don't do. As the, as the technology changes, the basic approaches to getting work are still the same for everybody or the same way of selling things. But today, I mean, you've been an ed editor. You've been editor, an editor and, and publisher for many years. So what is the role of an editor today in today's business marketplace? Well, it depends on whether you're, you're working for one of the... And again, I guess we're talking about two different... Yeah. Right. We're talking... Uh, the role of an editor in the 21st century runs one of two different ways. If you're working for DC Comics and you're doing Wonder Woman, um, you're doing their Wonder Woman wherever their Wonder Woman might be right now. And they can change it tomorrow, and of course they frequently do. Uh, so my job in those circumstances is, and certainly was for years, representing the company to the talents and the talents of the company. You know, we, we talk story... And, and making a fit happen where the company wants to take a character. Right. And, but also, I, I, I'm very steadfast in my support for the creators. If a creator turns in a lousy job, that's an off day. If, if a creator is lousy, then it's my mistake for casting those people on that project. And, and that's true, that as an editor, you're casting uh, right, a writer, you're casting an, an artist. Even here at Comic-Con, I've noticed um, the last couple of conventions, um, new artists or artists that have been developing their work have brought you their portfolios. But how does a how does a writer go about doing that? Is is maybe the route to get something self published a, a good start? It's a good start, but really where it starts is to just sit down and and try to find a few minutes with the editor, with an editor, and and just talk. Yeah. Let's see if you have a story. Let's see if you can put that story across. When I work on a, on a creator-owned project, then essentially I'm working for the creator. So, which is nice because the guy usually pays me to treat him really badly. <laughs> but we, we don't do that. I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's the reputation. You treat somebody badly these days, and they're not going to work with you, and why should they? Uh, but my job but then my, is but to... But my gosh, writers need editors. I mean, they really do. Well, so do ours. And, 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 and mom and your brother and, and your wife looking at your work is not the editor you need. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, although, if you have any kids who are old enough to, to, to be critical, they will be. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Uh, my job is also in, on an independent project, on a creator-owned project, is, is to get their story across to the reader. So I'm also the advocate for the reader. And that's true over at DC or Marvel or what have you as well. Sometimes, and again this applies in both areas, uh, part of my job is to referee between the writer and the artist or whatever. So, and some of the best books, and I won't name any of them, will <laughs> work just like that and I know people who have hated each other for 20 years who do wonderful work together and uh, God that's like a long day <laughs> but, they, but but they can do it because they're not in the same room they're not in a they're not in the mythical bullpen together in uh, some cases we really do isolate yeah but yeah. that rarely happens it almost never happens I think you know it, I mean, I've been in this racket since 76, and I think, uh, I can only think of two creative teams that were like that, mm. and I've worked on a trillion projects, so it's... And, and in working with the corporate giants, even when they weren't so giant in the 70s, and then, you know, certainly after... Batman, certainly after uh, what Marvel's been doing, Marvel's uh, being acquired, the acquisition by Disney, I mean, they're just, and, and DC by Warner, and that gulf. That we'll come back to our conversation with Mike Gold in a moment. I thought this audio essay from old-time radio historian Martin Grahams would be of interest, as one of the things Martin points out is how the entertainment industry, in this case radio, greatly influenced the comic book. In this case, Superman. Here's Martin Grahams 
talking about a particularly interesting episode of the radio Superman from the 1940s, where the Man of Steel goes up against, and yes, you hear this right, the KKK. For the Redfield Arts Review, this is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry. And now, Old Time Radio Revisited with Martin Grams, Jr. It took just a pair of glasses to keep Clark Kent's identity secret from his comrades at the Daily Planet. Kids who listened intently to the radio broadcasts, however, were smarter than Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. They knew that Clark was the barrel-chested man of steel who fought ongoing battles with robots, mad scientists, and secret spies. But perhaps Superman's greatest challenge was his 1946 crusade against racial and religious intolerance. Clark Kent's alter ego was already a staple of comic books two years prior to his radio debut in 1940. Most people are not aware of this, but Superman had three separate runs on radio. Initially, however, the major networks turned the idea for the Superman radio program down on commercial grounds. They felt they could not find enough sponsors to go for the program. Ten stations then picked up the series via syndicated transcription discs. This is when announcers and actors all sat in a studio, did the radio broadcasts, recorded them, and sent the discs out on platters to radio stations across the country. Before the show went on the air, the treatment and premise for the series were submitted to the Child Study Association of America, which gave its approval on condition that there were no references to war or espionage. These were familiar plot lines and programs for school-age children, such as Terry and the Pirates and Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. And keep in mind this was 1940, one year before the U.S. entry into World War II. So for two years, Superman, assisted by Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen, foiled fur smugglers, halted a daring gold heist, battled the leopard woman, the mechanical man, and solved the curse of Dead Man's Island. The radio program, not the comic books, also established the catchphrases, up in the sky, look, it's a bird, it's a plane, and it's, well, it's never-ending truth for a battle for truth and justice. Most people do not know, but when the actor needed to go on vacation at one point, the, the script writers had to come up with a way to write Superman out for a week or two, so they invented Scriptonite. And it was Kryptonite that started on radio before it was then brought to the comic books. The voice of Superman was actually kept secret for all 325 episodes of the syndicated program and belonged to actor Bud Collier, who later became a TV game show host for To Tell the Truth and Beat the Clock. Later, after a five-month hiatus in the summer of 1942, Mutual Broadcasting System decided to revive the series, then retitled instead of Superman, The Adventures of Superman, after losing their highest rated children's program, Jack Armstrong, The All-American Boy, to rival NBC. This second program aired five days a week, and within three weeks of the premiere, Superman's story was retold from the beginning in 15-minute episodes. In this second rendition, the Man of Steel was then battling Nazi agents, Japanese submarines, and while helping the U.S. government prevent military espionage. More importantly, the coast-to-coast -coast hookup over Mutual reached a much larger audience, and Superman then became a national phenomenon. The third run began on ABC in late 1949 as a new half-hour series format, and some of those episodes were adapted for the TV series starring George Reeves. But perhaps the most memorable story arc was the radio saga titled The Clan of the Fiery Cross, in which Superman took a stand against the Ku Klux Klan. He not only condemned the organization's intolerance, but also revealed secret rituals and recruitment methods. Here, from 1946, is an excerpt from that particular cliffhanger serial. Today, as Superman corrals the Knights of the White Carnation, Metropolis murderous bigots, another dangerous adventure of international significance looms on his horizon. And now, the adventures of Superman. After Superman had rescued cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson from the murderous agents of the Knights of the White Carnation, he resumed his guise of Clark Kent and accompanied District Attorney Agnew to the home of Vincent Kirby, the wealthy and aristocratic leader of the hate spreaders. A meeting of the rabble-rousers was taking place in Kirby's library, but just as Kent and Agnew were about to enter the room, a henchman of Kirby's slipped up behind them and jabbed two guns at their backs. Unable to extricate himself and Agnew from their dangerous predicament without revealing his identity as Superman, Kent stands still, his mind racing desperately as Vincent Kirby approaches them from the library. Listen. Well, 
Well, if it isn't my old friend, the district attorney. Tell your stooge to put his guns down, Kirby. I think not, Agnew. Who is this other fool with you? My name is Clark Kent, Mr. Kirby. Clark Kent, eh? Yes. Well, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. You know, you've been making rather a nuisance of yourself, Mr. Kent. Really? Well, listen, Mr. Kirby. Hold it, Kent. You listen to me, Kirby. We know all about you and your rotten knights of the White Carnation. Really? Yes. We know you had Charles Canfield murdered because he was going to expose you. And we know that you framed those high school basketball players on gambling charges in order to spread race hatred in our schools. You seem to know a great deal, Agnew. Too much, in fact. Uh Now tell your gorilla to put his guns down, because for your information, my men have your house surrounded. So I understand. I suggest that you tell them you've made a mistake and send them away. Fat chance. What do you take me for, a fool? Look here, Agnew. You think you're going to take me, Vincent Kirby, to jail like a common criminal? I'll send your men away, I tell you, and then... Then you'll take care of us, is that it? Yes, of you and of all who dare to stand in my way. Holy smokes, this guy is crazy, Kent. Of course he is. Better do as he says, Mr. Agnew. What? Send your men away and leave this to me. Agnew, this is your last chance. Will you send them away? No. Oh, please, Mr. Agnew. All right, Craig, shoot them. Not today, Kirby. As Vincent Kirby shouts his hysterical order to shoot, Clark Kent raises his foot and crashes it down with all his superhuman strength opening a great gaping hole in the floor into which he, District Attorney Agnew, Kirby, and the gunman fall. Down into the dark basement, they plunge wildly as Kent, working with the speed of light, resumes his true identity of Superman. Reaching the floor first, he breaks Agnew's fall. What the... What happened? Kent, where are you? Kent's okay, Mr. Agnew, and everything's under control. I'm taking over now. What happened? Who are you? I can't see you. Superman. Superman! Superman! Let me out of here! I'll cool Mr. Kirby off for you like this. That'll hold him until you get him to headquarters. Wait, there was another one, the gunman. The fall knocked him out. All right, let's go up for those other white carnation rats and your men can take over from there. Up we go. Up! Excited about the success that CBS has had with Star Trek and other such shows. Um, Whether people are going to be willing to pony up whatever it is, seven, eight dollars a month for... You know, I mean, probably two new series at any given moment. Yeah. They have four or five in the works right now, but obviously they're, it's like Netflix. You know, you, you're done with Daredevil, you go on to Jessica Jones, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and, and the production quality is is vital, because if, if these shows are as good as, like, the shows on the CW, uh, which they only own 45% of... Uh, then those, then, you know, word of mouth will carry them through. Like anything else, like regular products. You know, people say, hey, you want the DC Universe thing, it's worth it, it's really cool, it's great. The idea of reprinting old comics and watching them on a big big screen, well, I'm hoping the definition bears out. Right. And I could toss it on my TV. I am a subscriber uh, because I'm a fanboy since I was about four. Sure. So, you know, I'm there. The downloadable stuff, I'm a big proponent of, of online comics. Huge. Because, not because I think it's the future or even our current reality. Uh, mostly I'm in favor of it because we don't have to waste an awful lot of trees. And we don't have to waste an awful lot of gasoline to get those trees to the printer and get the comic books to the stores. Uh, now, having said that, I am also I love comic book stores. There are comic stores all over this country yep. that I, I stop in at. Know the, I know the owners. And Support the your local comic book shop. Absolutely. So, uh, you got to look at it as sort of a smorgasbord. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I think with... Um, a, again, a giant like DC offering a streaming service, and they're going to capture an older crowd with things like Linda Carter's Wonder Woman, and they're going to do new material. But the very fact that they're going to have graphic material, right. comic books and graphic novels, and I'm beginning to hear that the term graphic novel has become passe, um, and that it's now simply a book. But whatever it is, that, that might introduce uh, some young readers who are literally looking on a big screen phone or an iPad or something like that. Right. I read most of my comics on my iPad. Oh, okay. No, I, I'm 
I will admit that because of my antiquity, I have a 12.9 inch iPad. <laughs> but that's really cool because the luminescence is wonderful and, and, and yeah. the colors are sharp and the resolution is very sharp. And if there's something there that I really want to look into, I can blow that up. So that's—I mean—that's something you can't do with a printed comic book. Yeah, yeah. I On the other hand, you can't get an artist to sign your iPad. No, that's true, and that goes back to exactly like um, again, independent filmmakers. The the parallel with an independent filmmaker who can very easily get uh, a feature film made for very little money and then get it up on Vimeo and rent it to people for a couple of bucks. Um, you can't get. Uh, you can't uh, have the filmmaker sign your uh, iPad either. Um, and, and I am curious about that. I have a Kindle and I have a Kindle Fire, uh, but on, on the Kindle Fire I have not yet downloaded any kind of comic book or graphic novel yet. Um, I just haven't. I have to check that out myself. Well, Kindle is owned by Amazon and yeah. Comixology is owned by Amazon. So chances are pretty good that if you're on one, you can get on the other pretty easily, certainly if you have any sort of draw yeah. whatsoever. Um, so again, that's where that's where we're headed right now. It's had some tremendous success. Comicsology has been around for I don't know, close to ten years now, I think. Yeah. So and I, and I know their numbers are are, are strong. They're not laying off people. Uh, so I, I hope that that's. That that's the reason why we'll still have this art form 20 years from now. Yeah. We will have these types of stories in movies and, and television, which doesn't exist anymore anyway, on streaming services or whatever, just as we did long before there were comic books. We, yeah. You know, I mean, Zorro and... and uh, Sherlock Holmes and characters like that go go all the way back to the very beginning of film. Absolutely. Those characters are not going to go away. Those types of stories are not going to go away. Does that mean that, that Batman will be around forever? Well, you know, Lone He's Ranger is... Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and His day may come and go. Right, right. Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's show business. Exactly. And comics is part of show business. Not just because... Warner's subsumed DC. They were actually the DC's parent company for about 20 years, 30 years. And you know that's interesting because that's not even a semantical argument. It's not about uh, what kind of literature is comic book, graphic novel literature. It is definitely in the entertainment. It is run and controlled mostly by the entertainment industry. Well, there's a problem with DC in that they are directly under the the division that licenses is toothpaste uh, so so I'm hoping for the best for their future because those types of relationships seem wacky to me Marvel is in a wonderful position with Disney because they're making them so much money that, that Disney is just leaves them alone so exactly you know what you're doing go ahead and do it now the moment they have a, a good seven-figure loss that will change yeah yeah, but, but they're batting a thousand right at the Yeah, they're, they're doing fine. It's not <laughs> and ten, ten days for Marvel. Yeah, and they're doing very good. Uh, I can't remember. Sure, lots of quibble. Well, you can quibble about the, the quality of, of, of certain series and scripts uh, that they're coming through uh, Netflix. But overall, Marvel's doing very, very well, and, and DC has some things to figure out. I think the streaming thing is going to help them a great deal. One of the things that I am very encouraged by when I sit with you at uh, an event like the Baltimore Comic Con or any of these kind of events is <clears throat> on Saturday, on the biggest day when it's very cry crowded, the number of kids that are here. Now, of course, their exposure is maybe like my generation was exposed to Adam West's Batman on right. television. Right. Maybe we were still had the the spinner rack, you know, to physically be able to touch a, a, a comic book, that was more in our face when we were kids, when I was a kid. You can go to the drugstore and buy a comic book. Yeah, now you have to go to a comic hunt. book store. You have to go to a comic book store. And so there are a But I, when I see the parents bring their kids in here, and I know they're getting their superheroes first from the movies and that kind of thing, but um, I think that's very encouraging to see these, and I mean little kids who seem to be very smart, 
whether they're cosplaying, whether they're in costume or not, I find that all very encouraging. Television and mass media has always led new readers to the media. I mean, when I was a kid, it was the Adventures of Superman. Right. Um, right before me, the generation before me were the ones who saw it all on, on caves, you know, paintings, yeah. on, paintings on caves and stuff. That was my parents' generation. And, and, you know, that's how they got into it. But seriously, you look at the serials, movie serials of the 1930s and, and 40s. Uh, you look at them before there were comic books, and you had... Uh, certainly the Flash Gordon serials and Buck Rogers and all this other stuff and, that, and they were great for their time I, yeah. I still happen to love quite a lot of that but you know they're kind of kitschy but they brought in readers and yeah. before comic books they brought readers into the newspapers you know you like Flash Gordon well here it is in your local Hearst paper you know right, whatever right. so uh, and then they were very quick to jump on comic books. Spy Smasher and, and well, Captain Midnight was radio, but it, but it was also in the comics. And uh, Captain Marvel in the mm -hmm. 1940s, which was a great serial. So, uh, and plus Superman and Batman, never made a Wonder Woman. Yeah, it took a little while for us to get to Wonder Woman. A uh, long time. Long time. But... You know, Wonder Woman now is about the only thing DC has to point to in the, movie, in the movie theaters. And that's fine, because the character never, ever got a shot at the movies, and really not that strong a shot on television. Yeah. It wasn't very successful in first run. It was, it, in reruns, Wonder Woman has, has done well, and now, of course, there's sort of a revival because Linda's still around. Yeah, she's still around. She's doing events like this. And she certainly singing is singing and, and, and all of that. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, you know, um, as far as uh, artists are concerned, some of my heroes are now um, Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I we know each other, but one of my first artists when I was a kid, um, uh, it was a uh, oh a number three, number two, DC The Shadow. And it was Mike Kaluta, and and um, you know, to see Mike post something is still to me a thrill on Facebook. What a world change! Where you never think you know these people that inspire you and uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, the, coincidentally, I can wrap everything up into this one scenario. I was at Valiant Comics just hanging out with some friends, and Mike Kaluta comes in, and. He knows my tastes. So he whips out this cover, the original art for this cover he had just done for Marvel for Prince Valiant, the King Features strip. And of course the book is beautiful and of course when you you see the original, you, you, a lot of the fine line work doesn't really come through with the color on top of it. With the At that time comics were fairly cheaply printed. It's better today but not much. Everything was all wrapped up except that I was there as this, you know, comic book editor talking with friends who were, who were writers and artists, and I instantly become a fanboy again. Yeah. And you never want to lose those roots. Yeah. Because that's where, that's what fuels your sense of what's good and what's bad. Once you get over the fact that your taste is not the same as the next person's taste, you have to take a broader view of that. Because I'm the ombudsman for all of the readers, you know, including the ones that don't like what we're doing. And, and they, yeah, they'll go away if, they, if we don't change them, but maybe they have a point. Listen to them. Maybe they have a point.
Thank you for listening to the Redfield Arts Review. Please come back again for our next show. The Redfield Arts Review and the original content of this program is copyright The Mark Redfield Company. Shopping for explosives by Coconut Monkey Rocket, licensed under Attribution Non-Commercial International License. All other content used by permission of the respective rights holders or used for educational and informational purposes. Available now from Redfield Arts Audio. This house is full of sounds. My name is Roderick Usher. The loudest is your heart. Uh, who's there? Pounding with fear. The softest is the sound of horror. <laughs> In this house, terror waits for you in every room. No, no, not through that door. Animal. Madness. Mystery. Imagination. You'll find them all in Edgar Allan Poe's Haunted House of Usher.